Okay. Good morning. My name is Leah, and I'm Gary's daughter. Um, we're here at Lagoon Hills Nursery, and today I'll be talking about houseplants, how to grow them, how to help them survive, how to kill the bugs on them, transplant, and propagating. Um, so we'll start with what is a houseplant? Um, a houseplant, what I think is a plant that is adapted to growing inside your house um, or that can tolerate the indoor conditions. Um, sometimes you have to move plants around in your house to find the perfect location um, because it is tricky. My friend Greg would always say there is no plant native to the inside of your house, which is true. <laughs> Most house plants that we grow indoors are actually plants that grow in tropical areas that are hot, humid, and understory of bigger trees. So they get filtered light to dappled light or no light at all. Um, but inside your house, it can vary, especially have if you have like air conditioning or heaters, bright windows, no windows, no south facing windows with no sun at all. So I've been moving plants around my house for the past, I've been in my house for now two years. And before that I was in an apartment that was facing the opposite direction. So all my plants are now acclimating to their new spot, um, which can be hard and I've lost a few, but anytime I see that a lot of plants are starting to do bad, then I start to move them outside and they're happier. <laughs> but I really do want to grow plants inside because some of them, like the Chinese evergreens and the pothos, have abilities to kind of clean up the air, um, the toxins in the air, and make you happier inside of me. <laughs> so the first thing I'm going to talk about is location. Um, the locations in your house, I've been experimenting with for a few years. Um, the most hardiest ones to no light, in my experience, have been the zanias. This is called a zamia or a ZZ plant. And they come in, this is the most common one, the green. Um, you can find a black one or a variegated one, but these I find are the hardiest. At my house, I have a big one, about two foot tall and wide in a 10 inch pot that has, is in the corner of my kitchen where there's no um, direct sun. There's a window about 10 feet away, but it doesn't get any sun through the window. So it's pretty dark um, and it's thriving there. Um, this one was in my bedroom and I really neglected it. <laughs> you can kind of see, <laughs> but all the zamias in my house, I water about once a month. Um, if I can get to it, I water more often, but these seem to tolerate um, neglect <laughs> very well. So that's why I always highly recommend this one if someone is like, I want a plant that you can't kill and doesn't need water. Well, most plants do need water, but this one can tolerate. Underneath all the plants, it has a tuber's bulb, which you can see is coming out, and so it needs to be transplanted. <laughs> so they can store water in their rhizome, and that's how they survive um, indoors. And they just keep multiplying. So. If you want to control it, you can cut them, just chop them in half and divide them and make them smaller. If you want them to fit in like a certain size pot, like this pot, then I would just chop this in half. But the one in my kitchen is already five times larger and very hardy. So that's one of my favorite plants, the zinnias. You, you, you don't need um, sometimes you might have to, but I, it does like make little babies around it. 
Um, so other rhizomes. So if you can find, you might have to take off all the soil and then just rip it apart. Um, I can show you. <laughs> well, this one, you can see. Yeah, so see how there's different rhizomes? So, Z-A-M-I-A. So now you can see there's multiple rhizomes. And then you can make a bunch of new plants or you can separate them and spread them out so that they can grow bigger. A few of them at my house are like the size of a large potato. And in the winter, sometimes if it gets cold enough, they'll go dormant. And I just make sure that this stays firm. You don't want to give it too much water or you don't want the water to, um, when you do water, don't let it sink in towards the base so that this is prevented from rotting. So that's what that looks like. Another very hardy plant that I have in one of my son's room that has, they have a window, but it's always blocked so that it's not too bright in the morning um, are the snake plants. So in his room, I have this one where it pretty much gets no light because the window is always closed and there's a curtain and it just sits there in the corner. This one I also water about once a month when I remember to. And this also divides through root division. You can see kind of like the zamia, you can pull it apart and propagate it that way. If it's getting crowded like that one, you can either just take out the pups on the sides and let the main one grow bigger um, because they can grow quite quite large. This is the taller version. Um, this one here is a dark, it's called a black colored one. It's just very dark green. Snake plants. So yeah, I should write them, write the names. <laughs> so the first one that I showed you, this one is Zania. Z Z. That one. And then this one here is a Sansevieria. Uh, or snake plant. Snake plant because the tall ones look like a snake. Um, another word is, uh, another name for it is mother in law tongue. I don't know why. <laughs> um, and then <laughs> the short ones they call stars because they kind of make a star shape as they grow larger. There's that. Um, another low light plant is the pothos. There are a lot of different types of pothos. Um, this one is the silver splash pothos. And um, this was one of my first house plants when I was a teenager. I had it in my room that was a morning sun, direct sun. They can take low light too. Um, and I had it on top of my um, cupboard or my dresser and it just kept growing down and got to about eight feet long. And I watered it maybe once a week, once every two weeks, whenever I remembered. Um, it would really tell me that it needed water because its leaves would fold up and curl in like that. And then so once the whole plant did that, I was like, oh, okay, it's time. <laughs> and then it was happy again. And it's very easy. They grow very long and they make aerial roots so you can cut each node and plant it when the roots come out and they'll, you can make new plants. I start them at my house now in jars of water. I, when it gets too long, I just cut off the stem and stick it in a jar of water and it will root out. 
um, and sometimes I keep them in the jar of water or I replant them in soil too. So pothos, there's a lot of different varieties. Um, philodendrons, the climbing ones are very similar to the pothos. Um, these tend to climb up my walls. Um, I just put them next to the wall. I have one outside my sliding door and it is climbing up the living room and over the sliding door. And it's happy, the roots just kind of cling onto the wall and I just let it go. <laughs> and I give it a little spritz now and then if it's really like dry and I turn on the heater um, for the winter time. Now in the summertime, I don't have air conditioner, so it stays pretty humid in there. And it's by the sliding door, so it likes the airflow. So that does really well. Um, it doesn't, it gets a little bit of morning sun for an hour or two, um, but the top part of it gets no sun at all because it's climbing on the walls. But it still has color and life. Um, more about locations. Um, you do want to be careful growing some plants near your air conditioner or heater if you do use them. Um, I noticed in my house, I don't have air conditioner, but I did put a, um, the wall unit air conditioner this summer in my window, and a lot of plants didn't like it, especially the Diffenbachias. Um, this is one of my favorite Diffenbachias called Reflector and they are very tropical and obviously don't like the cool conditions of the air conditioner. They kind of just melted. And so I moved them into my plant room slash office, which is mostly plants. And that get, is very bright, no air conditioning, morning sun, so it heats up. And this one is now living in there. And it, this has a lot more color too with the brightness, it's more dark. Um, the one that we were growing at the store didn't get a lot of light, so it's a little bit lighter color. So you can still grow it inside with no direct sun, and it will look more like this. But if you do give it a little bit of direct sun, like this one gets the morning sun for two hours, and it gets more black in the leaf. That one is Diffenbachia, T -I -E. Diffenbachia, or Dumb Cane. They call it Dumb Cane because it has some toxins in the leaves that if you ingest it, it makes your throat itchy, I guess. That makes you dumb, I don't know. <laughs> but I think that's the reason why they call it Dumb King. Um, and yeah, those make good house plants if you have a warm room that probably doesn't get below maybe 65 degrees. They prefer 70 to 80. And um, watering, they'll also tell you when they're thirsty, their leaves will droop. So I water mine about once a week once or twice a week, once it's established. Um, the plant that I was growing at my house has been established for about a year, so now they can handle less water. Um, also important for location is the sun changes certain times of years. So one example is in my kitchen when it's winter time it's south facing so in the winter the sun is lower and it comes directly through the window and all the plants in my window seal get direct sun but in the winter time or yeah the summertime the sun is higher so i don't get any direct sun in the window um, and my plants if they're not acclimated to that and it gets really hot right away and like so this time of year in the winter when the sun is lowering they might get sunburned because they've been going all summer without direct sun.
So you do have to be careful if the sun changes and your plants aren't used to it, they could get sunburnt on the leaves. Um, you also want to keep that in mind if you're moving them around your house, if they've been growing in a really dark spot for a long period of time and you move it to another spot, but it's like direct sun through a window that could instantly burn the leaves. And that you'll see, it looks faded, can turn brown or just shrivel up or the sun, the, um, the trunk can turn brown. Um, so to prevent that, if you want it to be in a more sun spot, you have to slowly give it more sun, like week by week. So the first week maybe started out in filtered sun, um, put like a little paper towel on top of it so that it's not getting direct sun all the time, or move it in the sun for an hour and take it out for about a week so that when it is put in its permanent location, then it doesn't burn. Um, or to also prevent it from burning, you can take a little spray bottle or a spritzer and just spritz the leaves like every morning before you go to work and or leave the house. And that will also prevent burning because the water will help um, hydrate it faster than through the roots. So usually, well, I used to, before I had two kids, I would spray my plants leaves every morning, um, especially the tropical ones, because I wanted them to be more lush and grow. But sometimes you can't and you don't have time. <laughs> so um, I haven't been doing it lately and my plants are okay. I haven't lost any. Um, I did a count last night. I have about 15 plants in my living room, 15 plants in my kitchen, 15 plants in my bedroom, and 15 plants in my office. So about 60 plants in my house. And that's after condensing and taking a lot out because after having two kids, then I've lost some time for plant care. Now I'm doing baby care, <laughs> so, and I do work full time. So I have to come to work and I water, I hand water outside every morning. And then the plants, well, they get last, <laughs> last resort. So they get water like on Sundays when I'm off and have my husband to help me with the babies. <laughs> so I still keep 60 plants alive. It's possible when you have a full schedule, you just have to give them the right conditions and pray, <laughs> pray for them. <laughs> um, I found it easier for myself with time that if I didn't have time to water, I just grow them in water. So one of my other favorite plants is the Hoya. Um, this one is called Hoya Hindu rope and um, they make a really beautiful waxy flower. This is another Hoya flower. This is the tricolor Hoya, and they make this cluster of waxy flowers, usually white, pink, this is light pink, or dark pink, red, and they have a slight chocolate fragrance to me. Like in the mornings when the sun comes out, the fragrance comes out too. And there's so many different types of Hoyas, and I found that they do well indoors and outdoors. Um, this one I have in my bathroom that is right up against a clouded window that gets west facing sun. And it flowered this year indoors and it also rooted and it's growing in water. So I don't have to remember to water it. I just have to check to make sure that the water hasn't evaporated and make sure there's no mosquito larva in there, um, which is very important this time of year. So to make sure that there's no mosquito larva living in there, I do use the mosquito dunks, um, or I just spray directly with spinosad, which is an organic um, bacteria that kills any larvas. So this one is spinosad soap, which helps, um, the soap helps the leaves 
So if you have glossy leaves like a money tree or a citrus tree, you can spray it on there and it will help it stick to the leaf. Um, so this one, like I would just spray directly in the water and that will prevent mosquito larvas and um, in the water. And in the soil of my plants, I use it to prevent the gnats, the little tiny flies that suck. <laughs> They're everywhere. They live in the soil. Um, if you have like anything organic, like wood or compost on, in the soil, then that's what they eat, or fertilizers. So the little larvas will live in there and then the flies will hatch out and fly around your house. Um, there's a lot of methods to get rid of them. Um, another organic method is nematodes. So if you want your plant roots to be healthy and you want the bugs to be taken care of, these are beneficial insects. And you just, I just sprinkle them in my plants and then water after and that helps release the nematodes. Those will kill the larvas as well in the house plants. And, or if you ha think you ha are gonna have bugs really bad and you don't want any, any gnats or spider mites on the leaves or scales, um, the house plant systemic, you pour this into the soil of your pot and then that is a slow release systemic that the plant will take up through the roots and um, anything that chews on the leaves or sucks on the leaves will die because of this. But this one's not organic. So as long as you're not eating your house plants, then this is fine. <laughs> um, so I'll talk about the pests. Um, yes, that's a good question. So um, the water that I use, this one has been in here in this water for about a month. I do change it out if it grows a lot of like green fun algae, yeah, <laughs> algae in it. Um, and I just, um, well, it gets quite a bit of sun through the clouded window. Um, so if it does grow algae, I just dump it out and then put new water in it. I just use sink water for this. Um, um, this one I haven't put any plant food in yet. Sometimes I put a little, like a couple beads of the Osmocote in there. Um, that's what I use for all my house plants um, because it's a time release and it has pretty much all the nutrients that the plants need um, and so far it's been working really well but yeah if you replace the water um, yeah just make sure it's not like real cloudy you want it to be more clear um, there is green stuff growing in this one so I probably should change it <laughs> soon but so far the plant looks happy um, I have two in there this is uh, the Serapegia parachute plant um, we have some outside that have parachutes on them, but that's a pretty cool one that grows inside too. So pests on the leaves. Another pest um, is scale that usually attacks ficus trees a lot and dracaenas. Um, the ficus tree, I should have one here somewhere. Uh, well. A ficus, there's like the weeping ficus with the small leaves or the fiddle leaf fig is a type of ficus and the rubber tree, ficus elastica with the big glossy leaves. Those tend to get scale if they're indoors or don't get enough airflow. So um, what I've experienced with scale is first I tried washing it off. Um, so when I have a little tree, like say it's about this size and there's bugs, scales on it, I, what I do is I take dish soap and I mix it in with a bucket of water and then I just swish the leaves around in there.
to make sure that every single little part is covered in the oil, soapy, oily water. Um, if you want something stronger than dish soap, then organic is neem oil. Um, you can pour concentrate neem oil into the bucket of water and then swish the leaves around that. So, and that way you know you're getting every single nook and cranny of the plant because the scales and the spider mites, they'll live inside the crevices of like new shoots coming out and inside the branches or the nodes of the stem. So if you miss it with a spray, then they will still multiply and invade the whole plant. Um, Yes. Yeah. So, yep. And if, so I do that, if it's too big of a plant to do that, then I take it outside and I blast it with the hose and then I spray either the neem oil or if it's really bad, this is what I use. It's a more of a chemical. So that one I do spray outside. This is the bio advanced insect disease and mite control. And that I just drench the whole plant off outside in the shade, let it dry for like an hour or two, and then bring it back inside. And that works for a month. And any, and hopefully after you spray it, everything is dead on there so it won't come back or spread to your other plants. Uh, no, this one you can just spray on top of the leaves. And then if they do chew on it from underneath, that will still kill them. So this is the strongest if the soap or the neem oil doesn't work. And I use it for scale, spider mites, mealybugs, aphids, pretty much everything that houseplants get. You can use it outside on ornamentals but I don't recommend like edible plants, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, another very important aspect for a live plant is the soil. So if you really want your house plants to do well, it's good to research where they come from so that you know which conditions they grow um, for example, the oh, I have too many plants. The epiprinum, primnum, <laughs> epiprinum, epiprinum, pothos. This one um, it grows in like tropical, subtropical areas. When I went to Costa Rica, I saw the same plant growing everywhere, but the leaves were this big, and they looked more like the monstera leaves, fringed like this, when they climbed up the trees. And they were very happy living in that condition. Oops, I just knocked the fruit off. Um, so I was looking at them, and they were crawling all over the ground, which means as they move, they get different soil conditions, and their soil is always constantly changing. So sometimes if you grow it in a little pot like this, it will just start to escape and grow roots. That probably most likely means it wants to grow in a new medium. Um, so sometimes you have to change every six months to a year, change the soil underneath it to refresh and give its roots a new um, home and fertilizer for new nutrients. Um, usually the case is because the roots don't like living amongst dead roots. Like if, say, your plant was to dry out and then the roots died, but then it was still alive and new roots formed, there's still dead fragments of its roots in there. So every once in a while, it's good to shake out the old soil and then repot it in new soil. Um, and if you do repot constantly, these can live in anything, um, but there are some plants that are sensitive to too much wood or compost, which is in a lot of soil, potting soils nowadays. So, um, like, uh, for instance, we make our own soil now, 
Um, my dad started this the top pot in the 90s because he couldn't find any potting soils that were bagged that did not contain wood, ground up wood. And so he wanted to make something most similar to real dirt, which is like sand, quartz. And but quartz and sand is very heavy. So to make it lighter, he added um, peat moss, which is petrified bog. And that has a very, very slow decom decomposition rate. And um, perlite, pumice rock, a little bit of sand, charcoal to hold nutrients. And that is more permanent. So you can keep your plants in the same pot for many years. Um, my parents had a ficus tree in their living room for like 20 years in the same pot and it did well. Well, ficus can live in, very, in anything too, but this I definitely use for the plants that are more sensitive to root rot. Um, and I will be um, showing you how I replant the pots too. Um, so our our soil, the top pot, or even like pure sand, you can make your own soil with sand, pumice rock. Um, those two I think are, are, and peat moss, those are the best ingredients for inside because the peat moss will hold the moisture for your plant. And then the sand and pumice rocks create the oxygen for the roots to breathe, which is very important. Um, I will demonstrate how I plant my pots at home, uh, all my plants. So this is a money tree. A lot of customers bring in their money trees with their leaves falling off they, or turn yellow, the base is rotting, and I, it's a very big problem that I see a lot. Um, as you can see, this grower here uses pure peat moss, which is fine for a short amount of time, but just pure peat moss by itself will start to compact over time after watering it so much. There's no rocks or sand in there to separate it and give oxygen to the roots. So eventually the roots just suffocate in just the pure peat moss. So I always check the plants to make sure if they do have that, that I shake away at least half of the peat moss and add either the top pot or add rocks to it so that the plant roots can breathe. Um, and that really makes a difference. So I'm going to show you how I take off most of the soil, especially around the base of the tree so that it doesn't get root rot or rot. The water doesn't sit here by the trunk. So if you're afraid to take off all the soil because you don't want to lose the roots, usually I just start with at least one side so new roots can grow out that side and it will be stronger. And this one you can see most of the roots are on this side and at the bottom. So. I'll just do half like that so the new roots can grow out this way. And in my house, I just plant all my plants in regular grow pots and then place them in a more decorative pot so that I can change them out and it's not too heavy and it gets easier to move them around and water them if you need. So I start with putting a lot of top pot at the bottom. And then it's very important that when you replant it, you want to make sure that the water, when you water it, flows out this way and not into the base of the stem. So when I plant it, I try to elevate it slightly above the soil level so that the, when I water it, the water runs this way 
And when I do water it, I don't water right up against the stems. I water on the outside of the pot so that the roots are promoted to grow outwards and not stay in the center. So if you have the roots growing outwards, it promotes stronger base and healthier plant. So I leave an inch or two above the, the um, pot rim. And then I make sure that when I plant it, the plant isn't sinking in the center. So I press down the sides, make sure it's really firm because after I water it, sometimes the plants can sink a little. So you wanna make sure that you press down, not like super hard, but pretty firm so that when you water, the whole plant doesn't sink with it. And since this is such a sensitive plant, there are some extra steps you can do besides just planting it in soil. So you can see how I have it kind of like a mountain or a hill. It's on top of the soil and then I push down the sides so that it's lower. Like that. And then for the more sensitive plants that are prone to rotting at the base, I take a little extra pumice rock. You can use sand or charcoal or just regular rocks. And I put it around the base so that if water does get near the trunk, the rocks, there's enough rocks, oxygen in the rocks to prevent water from staying up against the base too long and that will prevent it from rotting and so I keep that around the base kind of like a little hill as well and to prevent it from sliding away I put a decorative median like orchid bark or you can use um, sphagnum moss or other rocks um, I like to use orchid bark because it looks prettier and if it's like a really hot location, it holds in the moisture. So as long as it's on top and not buried too deep, the orchid bark makes a good like mulch and decorative, um, more decorative. Because if it's indoors, I want it to look pretty. Um, <laughs> and I try my best. <laughs> So I, I use orchid bark a lot to top my plants. Um, I've also used charcoal because the black color looks really nice. Um, you just have to be careful to use a saucer under because as you water, the charcoal turns black, makes the water turn black. So you don't want to get that all over your house. So if I can get it out. So now I think that looks a lot more decorative. Um, so the pumice rock is at the base and then the or orchid bark, I don't put it right up against the stem of the tree, but it's around the edges. So that will keep the rocks in place and they won't slide away. And whenever I water, I water around the edges. And so the water won't flow into the stem. So a lot of plants that are sensitive to stem rot, like the Chinese evergreens or philodendrons or um, the dracaenas, those, that helps a lot if you just make sure that the water flow goes out rather than in towards the stems. And in this decorative pot, it has a hole at the bottom, some of my decorative Decorative pots don't have holes, so they're kind of like a saucer. Um, but to prevent the water from coming out the bottom of the pot, I put the saucer inside to catch any water. And then it looks, I think, more beautiful without a big ugly saucer underneath. Um, and if I water it too, I make sure that I check underneath every once in a while to make sure the water is not building up inside the pot because then it can make a mess 
or get stinky because there's not a lot of airflow underneath when it fills up with water. And then also very important is to fertilize it. So after I plant it like this, I just sprinkle the Osmocote on top, um, bless you, and then I water it in. After you plant any plant, you want to make sure that immediately after you pot it up, you give it ample water because if you mess with the roots and you put it into dry soil, they can dry out very fast. So you want to make sure in the process of transplanting that you do not let the plant dry out. So I water, I go over it with the watering can like that maybe about three times. I do it once and then I wait like an hour and I do it again. Um, especially if the soil that you're potting it into is really dry. Sometimes if peat moss dries up really fast, um, it takes a while for it to, for the water to repenetrate peat moss. Um, so you do have to give it a few soaks for the water to um, be sponged up by the peat moss. And for some houseplants too, um, if it looks really small in the pot, what I like to do at my house is stick more houseplants in there with it. So like this, you could even like, this is a pothos. This one is a marble queen pothos that was growing in my house and I just chopped off a piece. You can see the aerial roots. I like to stick those around the base of my plants like this to make it look more full um, that I would have to tuck it underneath the, the orchid bark but it kind of adds a little bit more to the pot if it's a really small plant. This plant can grow. There's a five foot tall one back there. They can grow pretty large um, so eventually it will fill out the pot. If you want your house plants to grow faster then start with a smaller pot and slowly make the pot larger because the smaller the pot is, the faster it heats up and the roots will grow faster because they're right up against the edge of the pot where it's warmer and that will promote growth faster. So if you start like in a four inch, then to a six inch, to an eight inch or a 10 inch, then that helps the plant grow faster. You can just put a small four inch pot directly into a 10 inch pot, but it might take twice as long to get to the height that it would if you potted it up slowly into bigger sizes. Um, so if you do just put it in a bigger pot, that's why I put more plants around it to make it look more full. And then as they grow, you can either take out some plants or chop them up so that it doesn't take up as much room. So that is how you repot a house plant. Um, also, uh, someone wanted me to do orchids. So repotting an orchid. Um, I couldn't find an orchid that had its aerial roots escaping the pot, but a lot of people will see like as their orchid ages, the roots will start to grow out of the pot. Um, I'll draw a picture. Okay. So here is your orchid. And the roots they are epiphytic plants, so they, in nature, grow on trees. And their roots hold on to the tree's bark or moss that's growing in the tree. And so you'll see these weird silvery green worm-like structures protrude out of the pot as time goes. And those are its aerial roots that are growing because they um, need more air or new, more water. 
Um, and the reason that they grow out like that is because after time, the orchids that are usually grown in moss, sphagnum moss, they start to get too moist and rot. So this is a rotten root here. Um, you can see they're slimy and they're not firm and they kind of just fall apart. Um, and so what you want to do when those aerial roots are coming out is take, chop off with scissors all the rotten roots that aren't firm anymore and take the aerial roots and repot them. I prefer orchid bark um, because it has a little bit more um, like space between it for oxygen and it's easier to replant the roots into. You do have to change it out about every six months to a year. Um, that's about the time it takes for the roots to grow back out. So the orchids will tell you when they need to be repotted as well. And so once those aerial roots start to come out, chop off the old ones underneath, and then you tuck in the new ones into the bark. And that, um, some people recommend soaking the bark with the orchid in water. I just water it um, multiple times that day to really soak water into the bark. And then the roots will have a nice moist zone underneath. Yes. And we pop with orchid bark? Yes. And that's it? Yep. I mean, I have so many that are Yes. <laughs> yeah. That and if you want it to flower again too, then you can fertilize. There's orchid foods that you use. Um, I just use the yellow one, which is, I think, 202020 for all the orchids. I just use the same thing and I add that to water and when I water the bark, I add that to it. Any questions about replanting orchids? Yes. Yeah. This, right, orchids, orchids prefer very bright light. I have grown them in direct sun um, they can burn, so you have to slowly acclimate them to direct sun, but I found it the best in filtered sun, morning sun, for a few hours, and they do multiply like crazy and grow a little faster, because in the wild they grow on the tree trunks, so I'm sure that's like filtered sun. Did you have a question? <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, orchids are fun, but they do need a little more diaper changes <laughs> than usual. <laughs> right, but that only happens like after a, a, like six months, six months to a year is the amount of time it takes for the moss or the orchid bark to go bad. And, and then every six months, new roots will come out. And if you see like the roots underneath are still firm, you can wait a while. But if there's a lot of, of the roots coming out of the top and they get like yeah. really long, <laughs> yeah. Then, then yeah, then you just carefully tuck them back in and replace the bark but only about six months to a year. Yeah, not every single time that you water. And how often should you water bark? Um, I usually feel the bark to make sure it stays moist. Um, you can tell the, dark, the bark will have a darker color to it. Like this bark, orchid bark was really light and dry. And so um, if you water it like a few times, then it starts to get a little darker. And so that's what they prefer is a little, like a moist bark, not, not soggy black, because that means it's too old. Um, but fresh bark like this that's slightly moist is the best condition. 
Um, we've, we've also grown orchids in pure pumice rock, so you don't have to change it. And the, there's enough oxygen in there that the roots are happy, so they stay alive longer. Um, or, and also um, lava rock is a really good uh, medium for orchids um, because it's very porous. And when you water, it holds a little bit of water, but also a lot of oxygen. So as long as you water more often in the rocks, you can keep them in there without changing it every year. Um, from, well, from when you water with the liquid fertilizer, it stays on the, the orchid barks, which the roots attach to. And you can also foliar feed them um, if you want the leaves to grow more nitrogen um, or the all-purpose fertilizer um, or even molasses. You can um, foliar feed the orchids or any house plant to give nutrients faster through the foliage if you don't think that the soil will, is holding a lot. Um, but charcoal can hold a lot of nutrients too. So if you add charcoal to your house plants, then that will also retain them a little better because um, every time you water, the nutrients do come out the bottom. So I like to add a little charcoal to the soil if there's not, which there is in the top pot. Um, so that helps retain the moisture or the uh, nutrients. I use just the orchid bark because there's a lot more, it's more porous and more like it's native, natural grow, growing, like on a tree. Um, but I have used, I, the top pot is okay, but it's still pretty compact underneath, even with the pumice rock. They do, I think they do like more airflow in the roots. It's more open when you use the bark. Yeah. Just cut off all the dead roots. Yeah. So if you pull out your plant, the orchid, and all the dead roots are like that, and the new roots are coming out like that then I just take scissors or pruners and just chop off all of them as close to the base as possible. And then these get tucked in and replaced down there. And then with the new orchid bark. Yeah. Okay, um, now I'm going to talk a little bit about propagating some of the plants. Um, this morning I took a cutting of my Monstera deliciosa, the split leaf philodendron. Um, it had a fruit on it and I broke it off, but they usually only fruit outside um, because inside, but I guess if you have a really big area, you can let them climb up like a really large pole or the walls of your house if you don't care about the paint. <laughs> um, but this one I used to have inside and it just got too big. So I moved it outside um, in my backyard where it gets morning sun. And it, this year it made about three fruits. Um, so this is a cool fruiting house plant. The fruits are poisonous but you can eat them when they are super ripe and the skin, the outer skin starts to fall off naturally. It turns like a dull pale yellow white color and then one by one, I think it starts from that side. No, it starts from that side. They, they fall off naturally and inside is a little, looks like pineapple chunk and the taste like a flower and a pineapple, very subtle flowery flavor. Um, and I have um, gotten seeds out of them before, 
the seeds look like little green beans and um, like one fruit I got like six seeds this year I haven't found any seeds maybe they weren't pollinated I'm not too sure why this one is too early picked too early so it probably won't have seeds in it um, but when they do have seeds it's really fun to grow because they grow very fast from a seed I planted the little green bean seed and in like two days it sprouted and after like a week it was already like well maybe six inches tall but they grow super fast from seed which is fun um, but they were all like the parent plant maybe sometimes if you're lucky you'll get one that's variegated they have all the different types like the albo monsteras um, usually the variegation is a virus that causes white color in the leaf um, but from seed it could also change it from the mother plant it might not be true to seed type or to the mother plant so it's always fun to experiment if you're patient <laughs> um, but yeah the monstera is a very common house plant very easy to grow it likes bright light but it doesn't need direct light um, you get the big leaves these are a new branch so they're pretty small but the older branches the leaves can get huge like three feet wide across and up um, and they do create aerial roots so to propagate it um, what I do is when it starts to run away I put a pot underneath the stem where the roots are growing and just set it on the pot and these roots will grow inside and as and when i can see the roots have kind of um, gotten bigger and settled in then i just cut the stem and you have a new plant already in a pot so that's called trench layering um, you can do that with a lot of plants that grow aerial roots on the side like pothos philodendrons um, even the Diffenbachias, I've done that to these, the Diffenbachia dumb canes. You can see they have little roots starting to come out of the stem and those will grow. So once they start growing, I chop it right at the base so that a new head can grow out shorter down or shorter so it doesn't look as leggy. And then I let the stem dry out for about three days in my kitchen. And to prevent the leaves from drying out, you can either take all the leaves off, but I don't like to because they're too pretty. So what I do is I wrap a paper towel, a moist paper towel around the roots that are forming. And then I, spritz, I spray the leaves with water every morning so they don't dry out and then as the base dries then I can take off the towel and either stick it in water to grow or stick it back in the soil and keep it moist until the roots get established so that's how I um, propagate any plants that have roots coming out the stem um, so you can do that with like the Chinese evergreen the aglaonema or the different bacchias. Um, another one of my favorite plants is the syngoniums. This one is the variegated albo syngonium and you can see this one has crazy air roots. Um, this one was growing up my wall and um, so I cut it and then this part I'm going to let it dry out and this part I usually stick in a jar of water and have the base stick out so that it doesn't rot because that is what I've seen a lot with houseplants is if you cut it right away and stick the base in the water then it can rot sometimes the roots are fine and they grow but then this part just falls off um, but to prevent it from the rot from spreading throughout the whole branch I just let it dry at the tip and then make sure that the aerial roots are well watered and the root and the leaves are sprayed with water. Um, I've also done this with Hoyas. 
the this one from the beginning, any Hoya. Uh, what I did was I chopped it every like two to three nodes, and then I laid them out in my kitchen and just dried them for two days and stuck them all in jars of water. And I had like 20 jars in my house in every window growing Hoyas <laughs> because I'm obsessed with them and I have too many. <laughs> but as you can see, they, they do grow very prolifically. So it's easy to do that on this one. You can see the roots also grow out the stems so they can grab onto walls and climb up that way. And so this is a node, that's a node. So when I cut it, I made sure to orientate it so that it's facing the correct direction. And then I would stick this in water and the roots come out from underneath the first node when I plant it in water. Sorry? Yeah, just like this one, see how the leaf is coming out right there? And then the roots form right below each leaf. Facing up. Yes. Yeah. So you can even chop them here, right below the first leaf where the node is, and let it dry out. But I always make sure to keep these moist by wrapping a paper towel around it. Um, I think I brought a s sample. It's hidden in the jungle somewhere. But I just <laughs> I, I run a paper towel under the sink, and then I wrap it around the nodes so that they stay moist and then keep the end where I cut exposed to the air so that it can dry out and that will prevent it from rotting. Okay, um, any questions so far? Any specific plants that you have trouble growing that I could maybe help you with? Yes, outdoor plants, I do that. Um, the same technique like to my avocado trees and my mango trees, I make sure that they're slightly elevated. And But when the water does run out, since they're in the ground, I make a moat around it so that the water doesn't go completely running off. It stays within, um, I started out closer to the base like about a foot or two away if it's a small tree so that the roots can grow out. And then as the tree gets larger, I move the moat out like after a couple of years so that the, the roots can grow out further. You want to train your roots to grow outwards because the oxygen is usually the first foot of soil. And the further they go out, the sturdier the tree will be. Um, but in pots too, I grow avocados in pots and I still make sure that the water's not running in. It's always running out. So sometimes after watering so much, the water will, or the soil will just move around. So I make sure to tuck it in at the edges so that it does move out. Or I put bark on top, like the same, um, like this, I put bark so that the soil doesn't move around too much underneath and then that will keep the water flowing in the same direction. Yeah. Yeah, this type of the zamia. Yeah, I've got one of those that I got little, mm -hmm. and it's usually about this long now, and it's yeah. in a pot this big, so I can take a separation out and start new ones. You can, yes. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And when you do um, replant them, like say you're going to replant a little one like this, you do want to make sure that 
um, the water drains out, but you keep it very moist in the beginning so the new roots can get established. Yeah, and if, if like a stem falls off, you can just plant the stem back in. Um, I, I let the stem dry out for two days and then plant it. Um, you can also do zamias from leaf cuttings. Take a single leaf and stick it in and a little plant shoot stem will come out. Um, I have, yeah, I love these. I have like a pure white one. It's not like pure white because then it wouldn't um, photosynthesize. Um, so it's like a yellow, because it was supposed to be variegated, but the leaf cutting, I guess, was a part where it's just pure white. So now I just have an albino plant and it grows very slowly. So in order to make it grow faster, I spray the leaves with molasses um, or sugar water. Um, my dad uses caro syrup, um, but for my houseplants that are variegated, if they don't get a lot of light, um, like the pothos or the syngonium, I mix this with water and spray it on the foliage because that acts like the sun, um, giving it nutrients through the leaves rather than the sun um, to create more variegation and keep it. Because if there's a variegated plant indoors and it doesn't get enough sun, it turns more green so that it can photosynthesize better. But if it's getting the nutrients um, through sugar um, already, then it won't need as much sun and that will help keep its variegation. <laughs> yeah, it could be sticky. Um, <laughs> if I do spray it on, then I make sure to hold it over the sink and spray it <laughs> so that the whole like living room isn't full of sticky spray. But you can also like take a paper towel and soak it in there and just spread it on the leaves that way so that you're not spraying it all over the walls. <laughs> um, this one is, I think, a tablespoon per gallon. So I just use like a little bucket like this or like even a, a little bowl, like a kitchen bowl and put like a teaspoon in there. It's organic so it's you can't like burn the leaves but if you do use too much you'll notice that it will like be brown like the the, the color of the molasses is brown so you don't want it to be too thick or else it'll turn your leaf a funny color um so i dilute it pretty well with the water like a let's say like a half a gallon bowl with one or two teaspoons of the molasses and then sometimes I spray it on or I just wipe it on with a towel and that helps feed your plants faster than if you were to fertilize them through the soil. No, no difference. Yeah, anything will work. Yep, sugar. <laughs> um, I also experimented with palm food if you want like another easy foliar spray or water um, root application. This one is like a, a granular powder. And I did my whole entire yard, my greenhouse with my plants in there, the tropical plants, and then through a watering can for my house plants. And um, this has all the nutrients they need if you want them to have more root growth and more leaf growth and fruit and flowers, then this has been working really well for me. Um, it's easy because after we got all that rain, I put a big bucket outside and then I just poured a scoop of this in there and just dunked my watering can in and distributed it to all the plants in the yard. <laughs> so if you have a lot of house plants, it's easier to do it that way than to individually sprinkle the pellets on. Um, but the pellets are, they do last longer. They last about six months. 
So for this Osmond coat, the indoor and outdoor one, it lasts six months and you can kind of forget about your plants. I think I only do it once a year. I just do a little extra on top and they're fine. Yes. Yep. I propagate plumerias from cuttings and immediately after I plant it, I put this on top so that it has the nutrients to grow roots and foliage. Oh, wow. That's a lot. <laughs> That's fun though. They're so beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, I'm going to quickly show you some of my favorite house plants that I like to grow. So this one is a Calathea macroyana, macroyana. Um, and there's a lot of different types of Calatheas. There's some highly variegated, like the fusion. And there's some that are almost pure green, like the mosaica, which has a very unique leaf pattern. But the purple ones, my favorite colors are purple and green. Uh, sometimes they come in pink. These, I think, are just so beautiful, but uh, they hate being inside. <laughs> I do have one in my bedroom, and in this time, since I turned on my air conditioner, the leaves have just kind of shriveled a little, <laughs> and they got spider mites um, indoors because there's not enough airflow by the window. Um, when I had an apartment, um, it was facing a south facing window and it got direct sun, which it made it very happy. The leaves would stand up straight and turn with the sun. So if the sun moved, the leaves were always pointing at the sun to get the light and photosynthesize. Um, so they did well when I had a kitchen with direct sun. I've had the same plant in a pot for about probably six years. It started at my parents' house and then I moved to an apartment and then I moved to a house and it doesn't like my new house. But <laughs> if it does start to lose all its leaves, then it will go outside with all my other calatheas that have suffered. Um, they love it outside, which I'm very sad because I want them inside my house. <laughs> but eventually I just throw them outside and they come back. Um, and I grow some in the ground um, underneath my other trees and they um, go dormant in the winter when it gets very cold. They also have a little rhizome underneath that comes back. So if you are growing a calathea inside your house and it gets cold and you think it's dead, it might still be alive. You just have to give it a warmer location because they do like it warm and they do like it bright and they like airflow and they like humidity. So I did have to spray the leaves when I lived in the apartment because it did get full sun. So I sprayed um, with a little mister or um, I've used a humidifier if you don't want to <laughs> spray them all the time. Humidifiers are a bit much, I think, um, because yeah, your plants, well, sometimes before you have children, your plants are your children. <laughs> or if your children move out, then you have time to take care of your plants. And <laughs> humidifiers are very helpful, especially if you have an air conditioner or a heater. Then that's what I went to, to help my tropical plants that I wanted to grow inside. Um, the plants that are surviving in my air conditioned room are the Chinese evergreen, Aglaonema. Um, there's a lot of different colors, shapes, and sizes. This one is the green Maria. This one is a red pinkish color. They have some with pure pink leaves. In my bedroom, I have one called white diamond, which is almost all white with green spots. And that one is very forgiving. It's right across from my air conditioning. It's very in a dark corner with no direct sun and it's thriving. So if you have low light, the aglionomas are the way to go. Um, that one is spelled 
and lay on Aglianima. Yes, that is this one. Oh yes, they do flower. This little, it's like a spade spath. Just a single, um, kind of like the peace lily and the one I showed you, the monstera. Um, apparently they can make like a berry seed pod and you can grow the seeds, but usually after they start to look ugly, people just chop them off. Um, but I'm going to keep mine and see if it makes a berry so I can grow it from seed. I have grown a few houseplants from seed and it's quite interesting to see what you get. Um, usually they look exactly the same in my case as the mother plant, <laughs> but it's a fun experiment. Chinese evergreen. The first one, this one that likes to be outside is a calathea. I'll write that down. Calathea. Yes. Um, yes. <laughs> um, one other one that I have in my bedroom is the um, the silver spathophyllum, which is a peace lily, or this one's called platinum. Um, this peace lily has like kind of a more silvery foliage. They also have like there's a variegated one, but it looks it is a virus the variegation, so it looks disease. Um, but once the leaves get bigger, they look a little more normal. Um, I like the plain green one too. The leaves can get huge, um, and it gets that beautiful white flower that sticks up above the foliage. And if it in too much light, the flower will turn green. So they like more low light areas, but they are very dramatic. So this is the first plant that tends, if it dries out, it just completely melts and looks very sad. And so then that's when my husband usually is the one that notices and it's like the dramatic plant is being dramatic and it's time to water your plants. <laughs> So that is the one that tells me it's time to water. Um, but once it gets wa water, um, it just immediately comes back and it's fine. Um, so that is another hardy low light plant that is surviving my air conditioned room and dark corner. Another fun one if you like climbing or cascading is the creeping Charlie. This one does get a flower. So if you want a little more decor decoration in your house, um, the flower isn't very big. It's just a little cluster, kind of like mint flowers that are a cluster with tiny white flowers at the edges. And this one, I know my brother is growing some in water in his apartment and it's just growing and climbing up his wall, um, you can train them. They're very easy to propagate as well. The same method, cut it, let it dry out at the tip and stick it in water and it will grow. Um, and they can take fairly low light. They prefer to have a window in the room with the sun shining through. It doesn't need direct sun, but very bright light. So that's a very easy one and fun because when it flowers, it's beautiful. Another one of my favorites is uh, peperomias. There are a very large family of peperomias. They come in all shapes and sizes. This is a watermelon peperomia. Um, this one is a little harder to grow indoors um, unless you fix the soil because it's very prone to the base rotting. So you want to make sure this one, the water does not flow towards the base and it will be fine. Um, bright light near a window 
It can take direct sun, like filtered sun or morning sun. Um, the parallel peperomia with smaller leaves, I've had a lot of success growing this indoors um, over all the peperomias. And this one is really cool because as it grows, it just keeps getting new branches. And then if you want it to be more bushy, you can just cut them. Like this one I cut and two came out. So then you can make it fuller. And then when I cut them, I just stick them back in the soil and then they regrow. Um, you can also do that to the Dracaena. This is another one that I have in my bedroom um, in a corner and it doesn't get blown on by the air conditioner, but it's next to it. So it still stays pretty cool. Um, that just doesn't grow as fast. And they are native like to Africa, Madagascar. So they're used to a lot of heat. The heat is what really helps them grow faster. They can grow up to like 20 feet if you let them. But if you want to keep them shorter, you just chop off their head. And like here, you can see it was chopped off and then it grew four new heads. So if you chop it, you can dry it out, replant it in the soil and have a new tree. Or when you chop it, keep it short and in a smaller pot will keep it contained. Um, I've, at my parents' house, they have one growing outside in the ground and it is about 10 foot tall and very hardy. So this is the Dracaena marginata. There's a lot of different types of Dracaenas, like the thicker leaved ones are the Massagiana and they come in variegations. Like there's one called Kiwi that is a lime green, yellow and, and dark green variegation. And there's some with pink. This one has red on the outside of the tips, but those are fairly easy. If they don't get enough airflow in the room, they are prone to mealy bugs, which I've seen. They go inside the, they start inside the tips of the branches, the new sprouts. So if you see like a white powdery substance, I spray oil or dunk it in the soapy water to get rid of the bugs. I also have an obsession with begonias. I have probably 50 different begonias outside and inside. Um, the begonias that do best inside are in my office where it's hot and they get morning sun direct. I haven't had too much success when they don't get direct sun. Even if it's bright light, they tend to melt. So they do need a little bit of sun and airflow. Um, so most of my begonias that started dying in my new, in my kitchen, they are now outside on my walkway where it gets morning sun in the ground and they are thriving. I have pictures if anyone wants to see. <laughs> but I love begonias because they always have a different type of leaf foliage and the flowers are beautiful, usually pink and they're edible. They taste like sour lemons and they're pretty and delicious. Um, this one is a very cool leaf pattern, the um, Begonia maculata. It has little spots that are kind of shiny in the sun. And my mother plant used to be in a pot inside my house and now it is outside in my backyard with morning sun and it's about four foot tall. And when it gets too tall and leggy, I just chop it, chop, chop. This is where the baby's from, my mother plant. And then just make more babies. <laughs> so that is a really fun one. And this is another type of begonia, um, the Rex begonias. And they call them escargot because they kind of have the snail um, spiral. Um, also, if it gets cold enough, they'll go dormant. A lot of my begonias have gone dormant in the winter, but they also have a tuberous rhizome that stays underground, and when it's warm again, they regrow. So 
a lot of my begonias that died inside my house, I just took them outside and they came back. <laughs> so don't give up. If you're growing a plant inside your house and you think it's dead, sometimes you can revive it if you just move it to a location that is usually warmer. Um, when I used to be really on top of my plants, I had a heat mat in my office in the winter time so that they wouldn't go dormant, which worked. The heat, like little uh, 18 by one foot heat mats, I just plug it in and let it go during the night and they all stayed alive. But now some, I just let them go dormant because I don't have time <laughs> for that. Um, and I'll make this the last one. Um, I've been experimenting because I have pothos growing all over my house. I've been just taking cuttings and sticking and mixing them together, which I think is very fun um, because like the dark black leaf pothos, the micans, um, this one, and like the light colored leaves are even like with the Marble Queen, I think they really contrast and look really cool together. Um, and also in my house, I have the lime green one mixed with the black, and that is really interesting. Um, and I've been experimenting with these hydroponic pots where I just put pure pumice rock in, and then the water sits at the base, and then I just stick the stems in the pumice rock and I do put Osmocote on top and then just give them a little bit of water. And I do change out the water about once every two months. I just throw it in another plant and give this fresh water. Sink water, they're not picky. It doesn't need to be distilled or anything. And yeah, they're thriving, I think. So you can always mix and match your house plants if you'd like some, uh, different textures. Okay, any questions? Okay, we're done. Thank you so much for listening and I hope you have lots of houseplants now to grow <laughs> and thrive. <laughs>